Dr. Adam Anderson, who will go into more of the other options other than prednisone, the steroid sparing therapies. Um, he's also from Washington U University in St. Louis, and again, covering treatment options. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Great, thank you. So I'm feeling somewhat overwhelmed as well too, Marina. But it was a great talk. I'm glad I'm not an endocrinologist. So I'll happily refer patients over to you for those problems. So um, I've been tasked today to talk about treatment options for sarcoid, uh, prednisone, and some of the other medications which we have at our disposal as well too. So I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves is when and why do patients with sarcoid require medications? And this is somewhat challenging, mainly because there is not necessarily a standardized approach. Sometimes I'll see patients where we diagnose them with sarcoid, I don't do anything, and the disease can spontaneously resolve on its own. My guess is most of the people in the audience here, though, have at least moderate or more severe sarcoid and have probably received medication or therapy at some point throughout your life. Importantly, like Dr. Parks mentioned as well, too, a lot of the medications we're going to be talking and using today um, aren't necessarily FDA approved for the treatment of sarcoidosis. We've stolen a lot of their medications treating rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune processes and have studied them in sarcoid, but they're not officially approved for the treatment of sarcoid. Uh, this is a schematic on the right side of the screen here, which Dr. Judson has published, which I think does a relatively good job of uh, presenting why and when we need to treat patients for sarcoid. And if you look down here at the bottom left of the screen, this would be somebody that has normal lung function down here at the bottom. If this patient develops sarcoid and it begins to develop some abnormal lung function, you can see that as we become a little bit more abnormal, there are several different courses that this can take. Sometimes this can spontaneously resolve on its own and really resolve completely. However, if and when symptom onset occurs, we can occasionally make this diagnosis, either start medications or sometimes monitor and not start medications. And in both of those instances, frequently the lung function will continue to improve back on here but to a new baseline. And this new baseline is because, just like I tell people, if you cut yourself and end up with a scar, that's fibrosis. And the same concept can happen within the lung and if the lung becomes scarred or fibrotic, I can't do anything to actually reverse that scarring. But the purpose of medications to treat sarcoid is to try to help prevent or reverse the inflammation and the granulomas that have happened within the lung. Importantly here as well too, we have symptom onset specifically looking at the lung. But as you can see frequently, especially within the lung, there's a large difference between symptom onset and then severe life-threatening lung or organ dysfunction. I'm a pulmonologist, we're going to be talking a lot about the treatment of pulmonary disease today, but importantly, whatever we think about our other organ systems which are involved, specifically cardiac disease, neurologic disease, or ocular disease, sometimes the presenting symptom or problem could be sudden cardiac death for cardiac disease, debilitating neurologic changes, or visual changes. So in that situation, frequently the organ involvement can actually start down here and have severe life-threatening organ involvement. And in those situations, we're going to have to be much more aggressive with medications up front. I think it's very important as well, too, to help clarify different goals and expectations. So if and when we make the decision to put somebody on medications, in the back of my mind, I'm always trying to help determine what I'm treating. Because I don't want to just treat sarcoid. If you're short of breath, that's really what we're treating and trying to target our medications for shortness of breath for cough, if it's heart disease, if it's the breathing numbers which we're following, and really trying to have some index or something that we're able to follow longitudinally so I know if we're getting better or not, and you also know if you're getting better or not. Um, the Foundation for Sarcoid Research has published this. This is available online, and it really reports and talks about some of the different medications which we use. I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail about some of these different ones throughout the day today. Everybody in the room here that has sarcoid or is here for a friend, I'm sure has received prednisone at some point. Dr. Lippman just did a very good job of talking about all of the problems that prednisone can cause. The upside of prednisone is that it works, and it works well. It's usually the typical initial therapy which we use to treat all forms of sarcoid, but really there's not necessarily a consensus on the initial dose, how long we should be treating patients, or a tapering schedule. As you can see on the top part of the screen here as well too, this is another publication by Dr. Judson, and he uh, broke this down into several different phases of corticosteroid therapy for people that are being treated for sarcoid. As you can see frequently, we start with an initial dosing of kind of moderate to higher doses of steroids, sometimes ranging between 20 to 40 milligrams. Some people start lower, some people start higher. 
but we usually use this for at least a few months to try to help diminish the inflammation as much as possible. If things are going well at that time, we'll then start to taper. And again, tapering over the next few months, trying to get down into this maintenance dose. Stay in the maintenance dose again for a few months, and if everything's continuing to go well, try to taper it farther, and try to get the prednisone completely off. Unfortunately, whenever we do this, symptoms can recur. And the decision always then is the risk benefit of staying on low dose prednisone or having to add a steroids bearing agent. Usually my typical approach is that if we're using prednisone and it's otherwise being uh, well tolerated and controlled and it's less than 10 milligrams, then I accept that and just use that as monotherapy. However, if you're having a lot of the issues that Dr. Lippman had mentioned, or if for whatever personal reason you don't want to stay on prednisone, we'll frequently use some other medications as well too. I think the most commonly steroid sparing agent which we use is methotrexate, again stolen from rheumatoid arthritis in their literature. It's dosed weekly, either with oral or subcutaneous formulations. We pretty much always use folic acid supplementation as well too. And the purpose of that is trying to help prevent some of the toxicities which we can see with methotrexate. Those toxicities relate to some liver abnormalities, some blood count or cell line abnormalities, and because of that, you always get blood tests at baseline and then with dose initiation and titration and periodically after you've been on this. Importantly as well too, methotrexate itself can cause some lung abnormalities and in those situations it's frequently challenging to tease out what is potentially sarcoid which is being inadequately controlled or what could potentially be the methotrexate that's causing new bone toxicity or lung toxicity. Importantly as well, too, as we continue to see patients with sarcoma that are childbearing potential methotrexate is contraindicated if you're interested in conceiving or, or being pregnant in the near future. This is for both women and for men. So if a man is interested in, in uh, uh, having a child as well, um, the methotrexate should be stopped for at least a few months prior to conceiving. This next slide here talks a little bit more about methotrexate. This is a study which came out in 2013. What this was was a questionnaire that was sent out to sarcoid experts from around the world. And I think the important key parts of this slide here is that out of the 100 sarcoid experts that responded, as you can see, the typical first-line therapy for somebody that gets diagnosed with sarcoid is usually steroid monotherapy in about 97 or 80 percent of the time. However, methotrexate monotherapy is sometimes used in about half of the time. Um, and a combination of both steroid and methotrexate can sometimes be used, specifically if we're talking about other organ involvement or if we're anticipating a uh, chronic or prolonged course where we're going to need to use medications for greater than a year. Usual starting dose of methotrexate range anywhere between 5 to 10 milligrams, and typically the eventual dose that we shoot for is usually between 10 to 20 milligrams. Whenever we talk about methotrexate, though, Frequently the same sentence we uh, offer or discuss azathioprine as well too. This is another commonly used steroid sparing agent. And overall it's less well studied than methotrexate and sarcoid. There's some blood tests that we're supposed to get at baseline that help predict whether or not it will be well tolerated. It's this uh, TPMT test, which is a blood test. And that's mainly because if this is abnormal, sometimes it can predict uh, challenges while using this medication. And those challenges or toxicities may relate to different liver abnormalities or blood count abnormalities. And because of that, we always get blood tests at baseline and then periodically throughout initiation, titration, and while you're on the medication. This is a study which came out in 1999, so several years ago. And the important aspects of this study is that they took 11 patients that had refractory or relapse disease. So these are patients that uh, continue to require uh, moderate to higher doses of, of prednisone therapy. And what they did was um, they started uh, the prednisone again, but at the same time they also resumed azathioprine. They quickly tapered prednisone down over the next two months to a relatively low dose, um, usually about 10 milligrams or so, and they continued azathioprine as well. And what you can see is over the course of two years here, nearly all the different clinical findings as well as PFT findings that they followed there was either resolution or improvement in everything. I think what this means is that azathioprine functions quite well as well too as a steroid sparing therapy. The question then is what's better, methotrexate or azathioprine? They both have their own different uh, long list of different problems, issues, and side effects. 
This was a retrospective study which came out in 2013 where they evaluated a whole bunch of patients, about 200, or 150 of them had received methotrexate, and about 50 had received azathioprine. As we go down this graph over here on the left, you can see that both of them were relatively well tolerated. 15% uh, of the patients that had started methotrexate discontinued secondary to side effects, whereas 25% in that azathioprine group discontinued secondary to side effects. Importantly, when we look at the graph up here on the top right, you can see that the baseline dose for azathioprine was just slightly higher in this uh, dashed line here versus the solid uh, graph here from methotrexate. However, at years one and years two, you can see that the prednisone dose decreased in both groups. So in this setting, both methotrexate and azathioprine were quite effective at decreasing the dose of prednisone that was required to control the disease. Whenever they looked at side effect profile, though, it was somewhat different, meaning that patients that were in the azathioprine group down here tended to have more infections and tended to uh, discontinue the medication more because of different side effects. Partly because of this and because of other studies which have come out, my usual uh, steroids grant therapy of choice is methotrexate, though I think azathioprine is a reasonable option as well, too. Ruthie mentioned it as well, mycophenolate I think is a new medication which I'm seeing used more and more in different community pulmonologists. And that's mainly because it's being used in several other rheumatologic conditions and interstitial lung disease. We use this commonly in the post-transplant population as well too. It's generally very well tolerated and sometimes limited some GI side effects. It can cause some cell count abnormalities, so it does require some blood monitoring at baseline and throughout the duration of therapy. Importantly, as Dr. Parks knows as well too, mycophenolate doesn't do a very good job of controlling arthritis or arthropathy symptoms. So if joint manifestations is a big problem of your sarcoid, but mycophenolate may not be the best medication or you may have to use something in addition as well too to help control that. This was a study which came out in 2014 which uh, commented a little bit about uh, how effective mycophenolate can be as a steroid sparing agent. Probably doesn't project perfectly, but what you can see is that on the top group here, they took patients that uh, had previously received methotrexate and were switched to mycophenolate. On this dashed line here up at the top, here's a function of FEC, so a uh, function of uh, breathing, as well as DLCO, another breathing test which we follow routinely. And what you can see is that uh, with mycophenolate started here at uh, visit zero, if there's been a decline in lung function while on methotrexate, and the methotrexate was transitioned to mycophenolate because it wasn't working, there was still a continued decline in both FEC and DLCO. However, if methotrexate wasn't tolerated, meaning that it may have been working, but it wasn't uh, tolerated because of side effects or some other reason, and it was switched to mycophenolate, then there was stabilization of both the FEC and DLCO. So I think in this situation, what's important to take is that if methotrexate isn't working, mycophenolate is unlikely to work. However, if methotrexate wasn't working because you weren't able to tolerate the medication, mycophenolate probably serves a purpose. In that uh, patient group, though, where they continue to have progressive disease, methotrexate doesn't work, azathioprine doesn't work, mycophenolate doesn't work, we do have uh, another group of medications which we have at our disposal. And mainly that's the anti-TNF therapy, which you've heard mentioned a few times throughout the day today. These are a combination of both IV or subcutaneous therapies, infliximab or remicade is an IV form, adalimumab or humir is a subcutaneous form. And here recently, over the past several years, there have been some biosimilars which have been produced as well, which for our purposes are functionally generic forms of these medications. They tend to be much more costly, and partly because of that, insurance companies tend to not want to approve these quite as commonly. And these are more powerful, um, but probably run a, a higher risk of infectious complications. This is a study that Dr. Bachman published in 2006 where he took uh, patients, over 100 of them, and uh, divided them into three groups and provided infliximab uh, to these two groups up here at the top over 24 weeks. What you can see is that whenever we look at FEC, so a marker of lung function, uh, within the first two weeks there was improvement in FEC that persisted throughout the 24 weeks, whenever the medication was being provided, as well as 30 weeks. However, during the washout period between 30 and 52 weeks in one of the groups, this returned back to normal, and in the other group, for whatever reason, it stayed uh, higher. 
partly because of this and several other studies which have come out as well too. Uh, if there's refractory disease that remains challenging to control, we typically use uh, anti-TNF therapy or offer it as well. So this is a slide which I think will be shared to everybody afterward as well too. One thing I didn't mention today though is that uh, I think one treatment option is always monitoring, so not using any medication specifically if it's a relatively limited or less aggressive disease, understanding that you're not going to have the exposure to the medication but it does run the risk of uh, increased progression. And it's always my default or my preference to try to do this if possible, understanding that I need to clarify goals for me as well as you as well too, that you probably won't feel better very quickly. However, this might actually minimize the doses and duration of medications that we need to use. Uh, for that, I'll leave it on the summary slide here and say that there are several different treatment options for sarcoid. Unfortunately, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's really an individualized decision both with you as well as with your provider what you and he or she are comfortable with. I'll leave this up here as well too and say that my nurse Anna is our contact for our Washington University Sarcoid Center and here's our contact information if anybody's interested in reaching out to us or hearing anything.